this is what's going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> well, hello and welcome everyone. I think, yeah, mine still says 959, I realize, but uh, I'm sure that some of you are, um, I'll still have stuff to pick up at will call at noon or after, and so um, if we get things started and then it turns out that we you know, are finished just a little bit early, you get a head start. I'm sure nobody's going to be sorry about that. Uh, so my name is James McGrath. I'm here with two of my colleagues from Butler, Butler University. And uh, let me start by passing around, I'll pass around a, uh, a sign-in sheet uh, just so we can uh, take attendance. I'll also pass this around at the end. And I'll also put the envelope there. If you don't have those tickets that they like us to collect to see how many people attend, then don't worry about it. Uh, that's one of the reasons why we're taking attendance. We realize not everybody has had a chance to get those. Uh, but, pardon? Yes, and we're recording, uh, put on a camera over there, point at us, don't worry, you're not on it. Uh, if you ask a question, your voice might be on it, but uh, we're going to try and make this uh, available. We have a, a libguide set up on our library website. Ooh. I'm not sure that we're going to be the liveliest group that's here today, uh, but we're definitely going to have some worthwhile stuff happening here. Uh, you also won't feel threatened the way apparently you might cross the wall. So. Uh, but we've left a, a, a column for, you know, stay connected just because uh, you know, there are lots of people I've discovered attending several trade days and just going to Gen Con generally, doing lots of interesting things related to gamification and the use of games for a number of purposes. And so if you want to be part of, you know, sort of sharing ideas and things like that and you want to stay connected, then just let us know. So let me start with some questions because we really want to do this interactively. Right? This isn't, you know, we're not keynote speakers at some kind of very formal event. This is Gen Con. And I want to find out how many of you have you know, done this sort of thing before, how many are new here, what kinds of things you're bringing with you so that we can approach this, you know, we can skip quickly through the stuff that may not be of interest to you, and so that we can really focus in and take the time. Uh, please come in, we've got more room. I'm your neighbor. Oh, okay, are we disturbing you? Are we disturbing you, are we too loud or anything? Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and can really focus in on the things that you will find most interesting, right? So feel free to you know, put your hand up and say, can you say more about that? In some cases, it may be that the answer will be, I'm actually going to say a little bit more about that a little later, but feel free to ask and make sure. So let's see if this remote control is working. Right, so I want to ask the question, what is gamification and why should educators do it? But before we even do that, let me ask you, so how many people here are in higher education? And how many are in something else? Is it an, another, form, another form of education? Um, so, yeah. How many of you, this is your first time at Gen Con? Number welcome. Wow, yeah, welcome. Yeah. You're, you're in for a treat, this is gonna be fun. Uh, how many of you have been to Gen Con, this is your first time at Trade Day? And I remember when I discovered this, I was like so excited because I imagine myself wandering the exhibit halls trying to find things that maybe could be co-opted in some way, hijacked for educational purposes, and then learn that there is actually a day dedicated to <laughs> figuring out how to do that sort of thing. Uh, yeah, there are, there are more seats, uh, so feel free to come in and um, I'm sure we can have people slide along or make some more room. Uh, we actually had asked for uh, seats that would uh, accommodate playing game round tables, but we're actually going to play something later. Uh, but I'll talk about the game uh, during the, the first part of our session. Uh, the room does not, is not laid out exactly the way we hoped it would, but I think we've got plenty of room for the number of people attending, and we also can rearrange things so we can play a little later. Yeah, and if, you, if you're coming in late, just please be aware there is a sign on sheet. We know that lots of you haven't had a chance to get your tickets that Gen Con likes people to collect, so we can say, we had a great attendance, we had a great turnout, let us do this again next year. Right? So uh, sign up and then we'll be able to do that. And maybe even stay connected if you want to. How many of you have used something game-like or an actual game for educational purposes at some point before? For how many of you is this something that you're hoping to do but you haven't done? Right. <laughs> okay, you're in the minority, but I promise that we will make yes. this relevant. Uh, but how many of you have ever developed your own game? Like, completely new thing, not using somebody else's thing. So, yeah, that's an interesting mix there, too. So, there's going to be something for everyone. Uh, it's, we're a mixed group, as you can tell. So, just say, yeah. 
skip that, or yeah, should, do we need hand signals? Right, like <laughs> skip through that quickly, or yeah, uh, or yeah, what should be more? Or, yeah, and crank this is crank up the volume, or you're doing a really great job. You know, I think I am. So um, if I'm not sure which it is, just keep doing it until I um, respond in an appropriate way. <laughs> Uh, those of you who have hmm? more, 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 okay, <laughs> yeah. the doctor right? Yeah, and yeah, goes to the bitter in the back, and yeah, see some really good hand signals. And nobody's doing that one. That, uh, you, you're always worried as a speaker that somebody's going to be. So thank you for not making that. Uh, I don't know about you, but there are people who still feel the need to ask the question: you know, Why do gaming as an educator? And you don't get that question much in K through 12, but one of the things that I noticed attending trade day at Gen Con was that there was a lot more related to K through 12 younger learners than older learners. And yet, you know, for my thinking, that reflects the fact that some people have forgotten how we learned and learned well when we were younger. Um, and we won't do the same kinds of activities exactly, but some of the same principles uh, remain. But I don't actually point to something specifically educational when people ask me, why gamify? Uh, I point to this uh, little bit of news which reached me through this website, which is um, io9, right? It's a great sort of sci-fi you know, fandom uh, information source. But they had this article a while back about Halo players spending five years to get into an empty room. Uh, how many of you, had any of you seen that bit of news? Yeah. Keep your way, right? <laughs> and I thought, that's the answer, right? Because in five years, you could learn a language and become fairly fluent. In five years, you can <laughs> accomplish all sorts of things, right? And so there's something there, right, that clearly this game has. And even things that were not planned to be part of the game experience, per se, but were a possibility, became a challenge that people then rallied around and participated in because they found it fun and engaging and because we like a challenge if it's the right sort of challenge and keeps, us, keeps our interests. And so if we figure out, for educational purposes, how to harness that sort of dedication, that sort of uh, commitment, that sort of concentration, learning will happen. And so if we ask, what do we mean by gamification? Right, I've got a, although I don't want them to spend five years trying to finish it. So. Yes, that's true, right? So we need to figure out what works for short term, what works for long term. And if we're educators, we want the room not to be empty. We want them to get there and uh, you know, take some stuff away with that. But gamification simply means, this is a, a, a definition that I came across, I think simple to the point, hardly needs to be made, but maybe we'll make it anyway. The process of adding games or game-like elements to something, such as a task, so as to encourage participation. And so, why gamify? I'm gonna go through a few reasons here. But do any of you know existential comics? Uh, any of you like that uh, webcomic? Uh, it's one I find a lot of fun. This is Sisyphus, right, with his task of rolling the, 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 the giant boulder up the hill, right? But they added this gamification element, right? It's like, achievement unlocked, right? Just keep rolling on, right? And it looks so, adding game-like elements sometimes makes <coughs> things fun that would not otherwise be fun. But at the very least, makes them bearable, when otherwise we might not find them bearable, right? Because repetition is crucial to learning, right? If we think about you know, something like language learning, what's the hardest part of language learning? It's that you've got to go through the vocabulary over and over again until it sticks. Right? And you need to approach that a certain way. And so repetition can be crucial to certain kinds of learning. And yet, it can also be dull, it can be tedious. And so how did we learn our own language? There were puppets and other kinds of engaging characters that made the experience uh, a little bit more fun than it might have been otherwise. We need regular evaluation of progress so that we know that we're, you know, we get these rewards, but even the sense that we're making progress, we're doing something, we're getting somewhere, right? which often if you're trying to learn something on your own can be a challenge, right? very often. Uh, you try to learn a language on your own, and it's like, how much do I really know, you know if I had to have a conversation from, the freedom to fail is one that I think if there's a shortcoming in higher education where we don't give students enough opportunity to get the full advantage of what games often provide, it's the freedom to fail. If we think about that Halo example, right, one reason why they were able to do that is that you go back and try it again and again and again and figure out. You, you had to actually crash your ship into something else, I think. I remember reading about this. 
and then respawn, and then you know somebody else had to crash into you, so it had to be collaborative, and it took a long time to figure this out. If you can't, if you don't have the luxury of failing, you'd never figure that out. And so, figuring out how to assess progress and hold students accountable to educational goals, and yet also provide the freedom to fail, those are some of the challenges that we're often trying to balance. And the thing that provides the engagement, like there's actually a term for it, it's called flow. Uh, the person who has worked on that, a uh, Hungarian individual, his name's uh, Csikszentmihalyi, uh, spelled exactly the way it sounds. <laughs> I, just, I hope that would get some chuckle for those of you who know the name. Um, yeah, if you Google flow and game, uh, you'll find it's a long name. I actually lived in that part of the world, so. Uh, it's Little St. Michael. It's actually the name of a place that has that name uh, in that part of the world. But too much of a challenge, and we get anxious, and we shut down, and we give up. Too little, and we get bored. And somewhere in between, there's this sweet spot that if we hit it, then we stay engaged, and we'll play a game for hours and not realize that time has passed. If you want an example of the challenge is being too hard. Has anyone here ever played Unfair Mario? <laughs> anyone ever come across that? I'm always I've afraid to. It. I've heard of it. Okay, I'm afraid to mention it because people then pull out their device and start googling it and, and get <laughs> chuckles at people. But at some point, you know, make yourself a mental note and um, look it up. But it's one where, you know, you know, it's Super Mario Bros. But it is you know, ridiculous and you know, stuff just happens that if if it was like that in the real game, you would get frustrated and annoyed and you probably wouldn't have that much fun. And so finding that middle ground. Of course, one of the challenges can be that depending on what you're bringing with you, that middle place of flow can, can be different for different individuals in the same classroom. There are other things that uh, gamification can be useful for, right? replicating off-campus activities virtually. When people make fun of gaming, one of the things that I like to point out is that you know, in a lot of academic fields, one of the things that we do in order to take a concept or take a real world uh, situation or phenomenon that is extremely complex is we do modeling. And of course, modeling is you know, sometimes itself a form of gaming, depending on what kind of modeling you do. But turning something into a game, game mechanics, where you're boiling it, trying to boil it down to its essence, not only can be useful educationally, but sometimes you can get students to make a game and to see how much they've understood that way. And so simplifying complex issues to basic essentials. It's something we do for educational purposes all the time. And so we shouldn't feel at all ashamed or embarrassed if we do it and involves dice or playing cards or little pieces that move around a board. And one last one I'd like to mention is stealth education. Um, how many of you know what chi is? Any of you? Some of you. How many of you know what chi is because you found out it was a, a word you could play on words with friends and eventually you looked it up? <laughs> There are ways that you can actually you know, acquire vocabulary, expand your vocabulary indirectly right, as a result of things. And so there are ways that you can actually just have something be part of a game and people will sort of learn almost inadvertently. And so as we think about game mechanics, I right, can get into some of the details. Right, the question is what is a game and what makes it fun? And so games are distinguished from play in a number of ways and there are game theorists who will debate this and because I was afraid there might be such a person here. I decided not to step in that hornet's nest and uh, <laughs> set us off down that path. But play tends to lack certain of the structure, right? some of the rules and specific mechanics that games tend to have. Right? There's a lot of overlap and the lines between the two can sometimes be blurry. But it's oftentimes the structure, the rules, the, the constraints that you know, turn play into a game. Right? And obviously you can have something like Dungeons and Dragons or other role playing games where yeah, there are rules, but there are also there's a, a whole lot of flexibility that you know, um, you know, people who are role playing you know, and doing these things in their imagination, even without the dice and saving throws and other specific details. So there's, there's a blurring there. Uh, flow, right? There are helpful things online that you'll find that will uh, sometimes give you some of the details and how to work towards that. Right? Finding goals that fit player capacities, right? clear and timely feedback, things like. In order to entertain, engage, and challenge, right, keep people interested. Who here has, at some point, 
accumulated a large number of gold coins or gold stars or something of that sort. Uh, or racked up a high score or tried to rack up a high score on some arcade game or something. Where are those points now? <laughs> in my heart. Where are those points? They're in our heart, right? Sometimes, right? But we will do things for the sense of accomplishment. Right? Uh, there are games which you know, I've you know, let fall by the wayside, right? Not playing um, any of the Angry Birds games as often as I used to. But when I was playing them often, I was enjoying them. And leave a few more decades and you know, I will get quizzical looks when I mention Angry Birds, right? These things. The time passes and sometimes gaming gets left behind. But we'll do things for that sense of accomplishment that we, again, there's another thing that we can harness as educators. A key element, and one of the ones that took the longest for me to figure out how to integrate effectively in my class, because I want students to be able to um, have lots of different ways of earning points, and I'll say a bit more about that and share with you a, an example of a gamified syllabus, is leveling up, right? How do we make sure that there's this chance to make progress and have it still translate into grades assessment so that students can say, okay, I didn't just do a lot of little things that earned up to you know, 100 points and gave me this A or something like that, but I can actually trace progress through structure, thing, right? leveling, right? the different levels that we have in games. We can do things like that in our assignment structures. And gamification is something that can work all the way from individual activities to the whole approach to education at an institution. Right? And I'll, we'll, we'll have some examples of lots of different levels of gamification. We'll, we'll level up the gamification as we go along. The sense of achievement in both short and long term, uh, added possibilities, I wanted to make sure I mentioned that in there because uh, those of you who are in higher education will have struggled to get students to read a syllabus perhaps, <laughs> or things of that sort. How do you? Do that. Well, one thing that some people have done is to use one thing that's a long-standing component of games and you know, now more so movie, hide stuff in there that's cool or that's interesting or that actually gets them points. Hidden rewards. Hidden rewards. So Easter eggs. So I'm, uh, I'm a religion professor. Right? I'm here with a, an English professor and a librarian. Uh, but one of the classes that I teach, and I'm using this as an example, partly because it's one that I gamified and I, I felt went uh, pretty well recently, but also because it's the class where I first tried out a card game that I developed, and so uh, we'll be talking a bit more about that later. But one of the things that I worked in here, um, I also BuzzFeedified the syllabus, right? So instead of having textbook, it's like, what one book do students in this class find they can't live without, right? Um, and stuff like that. Um, but, I also had 13 ridiculous ways that students can earn points in this class. <laughs> and gave them a number of things, right? And there were some things that every student had to do. Right? They have to do at least one short story, short uh, science fiction, and write at least one essay. But then there were other things that they could do to earn points. And one thing you can do is give some required things that have to be done, which maybe will get you to a, you know, get you to a C, get you to a passing grade, something like that which are low risk, and so students can feel like, you know what, I can get a passing grade in this class. Right? And so that question of, will I fail in trying to do something, and if so, will I fail this class altogether and have to repeat it, and that's going to cost me money. You know, we, sh we can understand as educators why students are concerned about failing. And yet we want to take some of the worry out of the picture so that students can feel free to take risks and engage and do things that are conducive to creativity and uh, ultimate, ultimately to their learning. Excuse and, me, I, yeah. I just interrupt yeah, real quick. Absolutely. Uh, just real quick, if anyone has uh, event tickets for this, you don't need to have one to be here, but if you do have an event ticket, we want to collect them yeah. to see whether or not we need to continue printing yeah. off tickets or not. So right. if you have a ticket, you just hold yeah. them up. We'll just and we actually have an envelope for that, and so we'll uh, pass oh, that correct. around. And, uh, Thank you. Get those. Get those to you. Thank you. Uh, but we've also taken a, we're also taking attendance. Did anyone not get the attendance sheet coming after it went around? Uh, so yeah, we'll pass that around one more time. Cool. Just because we knew that not everybody would have event tickets by this point. Oh yeah, so, totally. Yeah, that yeah. works. Cool. So, Any other tickets? Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Well, we're stopped.
Yeah. Um, would you be able to share your presentation with the email addresses on our list so we can peruse it? Yes, later? absolutely. So uh, we're yeah. we're going to have the slides, the PowerPoint uh, on the LibGuide that uh, Amanda will talk about a little later. Awesome. Uh, but I'm also uh, trying to record this so that. You don't need to feel like you're, you, know, you need to take notes, not that anyone would do that at a Gen Con three day event, but sometimes there's a little thing up there, it's like, where do we get that, or could you share that with us? And the answer is yes. Do you have any required quests in your list of way to earn XP? Uh, so in this particular case, I wanted each of them to do some kind of essay, but I then gamified the, uh, some aspect of that, so you could do a longer essay and earn more points, or a shorter essay. Uh, one of the things I've struggled to work out how to do effectively is precisely that leveling up aspect of things. Because I often have things like, let's say, blogging about reading that I want students to continue doing, right? And so the lower level activities are something that I don't want them to stop as they move on to a new level. And so figuring out how precisely to work in those dynamics uh, has sometimes been, been tricky in relation to the things that I want students to do. Well, I have you know, I have required exams and stuff that they, they have to take. And then I have some optional ones, and what I found out is they wait until the second right. hourly yeah. exam, yeah. and then they inundate me with all of this right. stuff that they're doing, so I had to put a deadline. Yeah, I'll talk so, a lot more about this okay. sort of structure in, in mind, yeah. um, and some of those very problems yeah. with thinking about how, how to do this. Yeah. But one of the things so that I tried... Just ask a quick yeah. question. Sure. Is this, have you done this in a survey course? Uh, I have done, I've done some gamification in something that's like a survey course, so a core curriculum course I teach. Yeah, like a um, you know, basic survey. Yeah, and so I, I taught a course uh, for the last time, uh, for the first time last academic year on uh, the Bible and music. Uh, it's the first time I ever brought a guitar to class and sang, um, I want to say with my students, but they're actually, <laughs> were surprised, you know, today's teenagers are surprisingly lacking in knowledge of music from the 70s and 80s, and so, uh, <laughs> uh, but worked in some gamified elements there. And that's a freshman and, level uh, course so they students, would take their yeah, first semester. Yeah, you know, it's, it, very few were anything other than freshmen or sophomores. Uh, but one thing that I found that was a solution to the potential for inundation at the end was to say there was a limit to the number of activities you could do in any given week. And so that kind of forces them to spread them out a little bit, and means that they can, even if they're gonna do the, the low level things, those need to be spread out too, right? And so that's one of the ways of encouraging higher level activities, deeper level, you know, deeper engagement, but also trying to make sure that the things don't all happen at once, because that's not that's not that's not to your benefit, and that's certainly not to theirs either. So let me run through a few individual activities and assignments, and there's kind of the card game, which I'll be talking about later. But I mentioned role play earlier, and because in a in connection with higher education, um, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention a consortium that actually has put a lot of effort into developing these things, uh, which is called uh, Reacting to the Past, right, based out of uh, Barnard College. Uh, but there are challenges, you know, getting students to engage in role play, which is hor historical reenactment. On the one hand, it's like learn, you know, researching the backstory of your character, or those kinds of things, and get students learning and engaging with history in new ways. On the other hand, what happens if history doesn't go the way it's, you know, are they really learning history or are they doing, you know, Man in the High Castle, you know, or something, you know, <laughs> different than history. Uh, and so, but there are some really good resources for historical reenactment. And so RTTP, Reacting to the Past, is one that has done some uh, very interesting things. Uh, but in addition to role play, there are variations on role play, smaller level, right? So a lot of the reacting to the past things, you know, will run for a whole semester, yeah. and students will do historical reenactment. But you can do role play in a single class that's similar, engaging in debates or mock trials or things like that. Uh, if you have the right set of skills or people that you can work with, you can develop an app, right, where students can maybe be earning points to, let's say, learn new vocabulary on the go or something like that. Uh, interactive quizzes. Uh, I love choose your own adventure stories, which again are you know have some game like elements in the reading experience. And I was delighted, you know, having spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to do some of these things on my own, to discover that uh, Moodle, uh, which some people use as a course management system, actually has essentially one of the modules is a choose your own adventure kind of setup, right? Because one of the challenges that I face, right, we mentioned that to keep flow 
you really need to start where the learner is and move them on from there. But what do you do if a class is very diverse? Right? Um, as somebody who teaches biblical studies, I've benefited a little bit, uh, for better or worse, from the decline in overall biblical literacy in our society, uh, because now most students come in, regardless of whether they're religious or not, still not knowing that much, right? uh, which makes some things easier. But on the other hand, there's still this need to start where students are in whatever subject and try to keep them engaged right, in different ways. And so, Developing a module which asks them questions, and then depending on their answers, maybe presents the same material but in different ways. There are now platforms built into some of the course management uh, software that we use that will we'll provide the setup for that. All you need to do is plug in the content. Uh, online scavenger hunts, uh, one of the sessions that uh, some of you like me are sorry you're missing because you're in here, is uh, focused on uh, information literacy skills, right, which are very important. And Sending students out to, you know, it's like, find, you know, find some examples of something that's on the internet that's simply not true. Right? And then find something that is a reliable source of information. And you know, whoever finds the most and can explain why these are this kind of source right? gets the you know, most points. Board games, card games, and I'll say more about that last one later. Uh, but let me now hand over to Jason Goldsmith, who's going to talk about his gamified approach in uh, the teaching of English, and he's done a number of things related to gamification, and so I will uh, bring up a preview of what he has there, but I'm actually gonna go to the uh, laptop and try and see if I can get his uh, PDFs up there so that he, can, he can show you all the details. All right, so yeah, as James said, I teach English, and um, there are a lot of different ways that we can um, incorporate games into the education. One of the most basic ways is um, just thinking about, I've started offering classes on video games and narrative theory. Right? Lots of people say, oh, you can't talk about sort of narrative in video games. Well, you can, right? You can talk about different forms of narrative. Uh, so I've, I've offered that class a couple of times. Um, I've also uh, written and published a piece on uh, Robert Louis Stevenson's uh, Jekyll and Hyde um, that talks about different, and this was a long time ago, and, it, and this was before I was even thinking about gamification, in which um, I had students in different levels of courses um, enact the trial, right? Is um, Jekyll guilty of the crimes of Edward Hyde? And they would have to uh, comb through the text to find evidence to support their arguments, split the class up into prosecution, defense, and, and grand jury. But what I want to talk about today is um, something that James began discussing is more of a gamified syllabus. Um, I didn't use a game in a class, but I organized the class as something like a game. And I used this model um, in, I believe, four classes over two semesters. This was for uh, freshman writing, first year writing seminar, right? So it's, it's and one of the sessions, one of the sections was for an upper division literature class. Um, we have a visiting writer series where we bring in a number of amazing writers every year. And our first year seminars can be linked to different themes, right? So mine tended to be linked to the visiting writer series. And so what I wanted to do was to think about that example that James gave you of the um, Halo players spending all that time and energy and commitment trying to get into this room that ostensibly you cannot get into, but they figure out a way to get into it. How do you harness that kind of motivation um, in the classroom? I don't think you really can do it 100% because these are very different kind of environments, but nonetheless, I wanted students to be incentivized to do the work, to right? find ways that they were encouraged positively, they were enthusiastic, they wanted to undertake it rather than um, them submitting assignments and, and feeling like I was taking points away from them. So I tried to develop a model where they would earn points as opposed to one where they're being sort of marked down. So I didn't want the response to be, oh man, I only got six out of 10, which leads to the end of the semester. You know, what grade did Goldsmith give? I don't give grades. Students earn grades but how do we make them realize that, right? So I wanted it to be something where like,